Bags and Boards podcast number 72. And we back. Long box comics look like they embody bags. Eddie Brock when I rock spit venom watch body shakes. If you ain't up on all then you a foe and I can't relate. You now tuned in to Comic Tom and mother Donnie Case. Ladies and gentlemen, years ago I thought I could convince Sir Case to join me on a podcast paid Javon Jordan Illis Umanati to create this intro. And there it is. I thought it would be fitting to at least show the group this, and you guys got a kick out of it. Dude, I love the beat. I thought it was great. I had no idea you did this, and you threw it on, and I was bobbing my head. It didn't work, though, right? Donnie's not here. Donnie, come back! Bags and Boards podcast number 72. We're available on SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher, and iTunes. We've actually come back to the mic more in the last couple weeks than we have all year long, mostly because of Crashdown, which is in previews right now. Tom and I wrote that together. It's in previews right now. Right now, still, right now, I believe until the next one comes out, you still got a few weeks to pre-order issue number one of Crashdown with art by Ben Templesmith. That's right. Shout out to Michael Calero for helping us out on the edit. We have a packed show for the community. We have more conversations to have with the Golden Age guru about the collection find, a giant 350,000 unit count. And you picked a very unique collectible to talk about? There was only one book that I sold from this collection in the Golden Age, and uh, we're going to discuss it here real soon. And uh, my voice, yeah, that's going to come back eventually. Yo, that's comic <laughs> Butch. He is certainly in the house. We also are going to chat about the writer's strike and how that possibly can affect the comic book collector's market. There's a lot going on. We also have a comic book that you need to not cancel. Butch has strong opinions on that one, too, so you'll have to stay tuned. Butch says cancel it. The first thing I want to get to, though, is a giant, massive sale. And we got to take you back just a couple weeks. I got GPA pulled up for a reason. We have a Mark Jewelers newsstand, which are, by the way, the same thing. It's actually a subcategory of newsstands. You want to get into that real quick and explain it? Give them a rundown. Yeah, so, um, you know, like you said, um, all news, all Mark Jewelers are newsstands, but not all newsstands are Mark Jewelers. So the Mark Jewelers is an insert that was placed inside of a comics, and they were generally distributed onto army bases and other small test markets so that people who were looking to get rings for their girlfriends so that they could future get married after the war or whatever service they were doing, they were able to order those rings through the comic books, and hence those became... Mark Jewelers. Upwards of 5% of the print run is suggested and predicted to have been created back in the day. Many of these were torn out and used. Even more of them were just read and tossed, and it's really difficult to find them, let alone high-grade copies. Now, let's take you back to 2020, okay? This is the start of the newsstand craze. You're going to know you have a newsstand over a direct market copy. How? The barcode. The barcode indicates that this wasn't sold in a traditional way because at the time, LCSs in direct market was a thing. So you could either have a comic on order, have it show up, bag and board it, put it in your lawn box, boom, you got a 9.8 and it survived. Or you had a newsstand. You had to go to a shop. You had to go to a market. You had to go to 7-Eleven. a 7-Eleven. 7-Eleven indeed. And then that raw comic on the stand was then ideally bagged and boarded and preserved, but it lived a more dangerous life, which is why 9.8s of newsstands have skyrocketed. Back in 2020, first appearance of Gambit, X-Men 266 hit $2,000 for the first time in comic history, which was an outstanding jump for this collectible. I actually have a newsstand 9.8 that I purchased then after seeing that Mark Jeweler. Jeff's over here looking for it, but Ryan's holding it. (laughs) I grabbed it. Sorry, I should have told you. (laughs) And what do you think about this copy? It's it pretty beautiful. A, it is a newsstand, but I don't think it's a Mark Jewelers. It, You'd be able to tell from the top, correct? Indeed. I don't see it. I don't see yeah, it. Yeah, because they were very, uh, it was a, th- a much thicker paper, like a cardboard type. And usually they came in a variety of colors, purple, black, you know, blue, whatever. So you, you should be able to see it from the top. Does it say on the CTC label? Absolutely. Okay. So $2,000 the market was set, and we haven't seen a Mark Jewelers sale for three years. This right here just tells you how scarce these are at that peak grade. Well, 
Over the last two weeks, there's been a new sale clocked in April 2023 of $10,600, near $8,000 increase in three years in a market that many would call down. So wait, is that the same book that sold or a different 98? Are there multiple? Be good to check yeah, if it's the same serial number. I wonder if we can check that. I do not. Um, different number. They are different numbers. So there's more than one. There's more than one Mark Interesting. Jeweler. So how do you feel about this price hike? And what does that say about the collector's base and their preference on scarcity? You know, for me, I've been in the industry a very, very long time. And I've owned, I don't know how many 266s or however many other books over and over and over. And after a certain amount of time, it's just another of the same. So to start... Um, dwindling it down to something more rare of still a really key book like the 266 and going to a newsstand and now knowing that you can get a Mark Jewelers, I think for that select group of people who've already had it before, it's something far more special and it is a lot of money. So it's a hard number to digest even for somebody like myself who, you know, kind of plays in that more oddity area. So you know, but again, we know there's at least two copies, but there's so many other nine eights that are not Mark Jewelers and even that are newsstands. So I'm not shocked by the number, but it is still a hard number to hear for many, I'm sure. What do you think about that? That definitely puts it out of people's reach. You know, like you said, that's over $8,000 more than the last time it sold. So if you think you could have maybe got it at 2K, Probably not going to be able to swing 10,000 plus. Well, I actually have CGC census pulled up right now. And keep in mind, Mark Jewelers make up at the time of printing upwards of 5% of the total print run, which means 9.8s are under 1%, far under. Well, the total 9.8 census count on CGC of 9.8 copies is 3,444. Well, let me ask you this then. Would you rather have a 9.8 standard copy in a 10.0? Or would you rather have a 9.8 Mark Jewelers? That's a great question. Because according to the census, there are zero 10.0s in existence. However, there are 15 9.9s. So I'm going to kick this to the community. What do you think about Mark Jewelers versus a higher graded 9.9? Because you're getting awfully close to that like similar comparison in percentage. And I happen to have GPA on here. And we have the last 9.9 sale taking place back in 2015, where it sold for $3,228. So it sounds like the market speaks, because if that's a 9.9, just regular copy for $3,000 plus in 2013, I mean, maybe there wasn't 15 copies at the time. I mean, you just said a 9.8 uh, Mark Jewelers only sold for two k right? just a few years ago. But ten k now, so it's like, oh, man. I, I, I don't know. If I had to decide, I think I would go with the 10.0. If the 10 was an option. What about the 9-9 versus Mark? Because here's another factor no, I want to throw out there. You wouldn't do it. What would you do? I feel like as a collector, I would rather have the 9-9 if I'm not going to flip it. I feel like a financial investment, the uh, the new Mark Jeweler seems to make more sense, especially so, now. Now I want to add an extra variable to this and kick it to the community. When you're talking about a 9-9, uh, granted, grading is low-key subjective per grading company. Yes, that's on the table. We have to acknowledge that. But when you're talking about a 9.9 .9 versus 9.8, .9, I think it's even more so. You're buying it more for the label than the actual comic on the inside. Mark Jewelers literally is a different item. So when you apply that variable, I think I would go with the Mark J. I got to know what the community thinks in the comment section below. Hit the like, slap the subscribe, and Ryan hit me up and said, you need to prevent yourself from missing out on this title. Don't cancel it. We chatted about this one run of books, and I fell off. But you're holding me to it, and I know why. I'm holding you to it in spite of uh, a lifetime disinterest in this character, too. We're talking about the Hulk, and speaking from 100% honesty, the Hulk is a character I have never really cared about before, at least up until reading Immortal Hulk by Al Ewing. In 2018. Have you read Hulk prior to Immortal Hulk? I did, and I read something that I loved. I liked Immortal Hulk, but I tell you what I loved more, and it's a tough one, is Planet Hulk. Planet Hulk, like, I don't generally read superhero books. I like to read the non-superhero stuff I tend to enjoy more. But Planet Hulk was so amazing and captivating that it took me to World War Hulk and all the side stories on top of that. But Immortal Hulk, 
is again a very interesting take on Hulk and was very captivating and fun to read as well. And there was a pretty big gap in between Planet Hulk and Immortal Hulk as well. So you were off the Hulk train and then back on because of Immortal Hulk, similar to Ryan, similar to myself. Another recommendation of Hulk stories is the Infinity Gauntlet crossover, by the way. Hulk turns into a, it's actually courtesy of Thanos when they're fighting on Battleworld for the first time. Thanos like shrinks him. So he's like Ant-Man size. And there's a whole narrative where he's like just chilling with Abomination and Abomination thinks he's God and that he's talking to this like higher power the entire issue. It's a it's a single issue that has stuck with me for so long. But I digress. We're not talking about that book. We're talking about the Hulk, because once Al Ewing passed the baton, who did it go to? So, yeah, once Immortal Hulk reached its 50 issue mark. They announced that the uh, the new creative team, the new creative team being Donny Cates and Ryan Otley on the art, at which point I I couldn't cancel the book. I was gonna give up on the Hulk because I figured there'd no be, there'd be no topping Immortal Hulk and Al, what Al Ewing was able to do with that book. Hulk was on the chopping block for sure until they announced Donny Cates is the new writer, and I'm like I gotta read it. It's Donny Cates. I gotta keep him on my pull list. So I continued on with Hulk for about you know 14 issues or however long his run ultimately ended up being. Spoiler alert: I did not end up loving it. Did you fall off after Immortal Hulk or did you keep reading to Donny Cates Hulk? Because during that transition, I was about to stop reading it until Donny Cates took it on. I stopped reading Brown after issue 15 or so. So I didn't even get to like the other great parts of things to come. I got to hear how it kept getting so stupendous and amazing. But that's only me. Like I do that with TV shows too. I'll watch the first two, three seasons, thinks it's great. And then I, something else will take my attention and I'm like off of it. And so that's my own fault, but I, I, I hear how it's pretty freaking amazing. Well, unfortunately, as it pertains to Donny Cates Hulk, which is like Spaceship Hulk, you know, you got uh, Bruce Banner trapped in the brain of the Hulk, man in the station. It's pretty cool. It's out there. It's very strange. But that coming to an end, there's going to be another transition, and I'm hearing crickets right now. But then, bomb dropped, the next writer on the Hulk has me back in, which is why you can't cancel Hulk. And if you already did, you need to get back on. Yeah, I mean, maybe I just like the Hulk. Maybe that's what this whole experience is teaching me because I keep looking for a reason to get off the book because I don't think I like the character. But then you get you get Al Ewing's Immortal Hulk leading into Donny Cates, and now they've announced the next creative team on the Hulk, which will be uh, one of my top favorite writers right now, Philip Kennedy Johnson, with art by uh, Nick Klein on the new run of Hulk that starts very soon. So this is a writer that you got to pay attention to. He single-handedly made Superman relevant all of last year. Yeah, if you're one of the uh, basically everybody out there who says Superman is lame and not worth reading and he's got too many powers and he's boring and I don't care, you need to read Philip Kennedy Johnson's run on action comics, specifically the War World saga. It's great. It's really good. Superman is stripped from all of his powers and has to go full savage on a different planet. It's fantastic. You even get a team up with James Gunn's next project. Right. Yeah, he brings the authority with him to help free the slaves from Mongol and War World because it's too uh, it's too dark of a task to bring the Justice League along on. So it's it's good stuff. But I mean, I think I, he's he's one of my favorite writers right now for a reason. His run on Alien was phenomenal. He's writing a 007 comic for Dynamite, which is also weirdly really good. What's this guy's name again? Philip Kennedy Johnson. Philip Kennedy Johnson. Also check out The Last God, one of my favorite things I've read probably ever. And this is why I wanted to bring this up today. So many of the comic reader community is focused so much on the IP. I'm reading Hulk. Hulk's not that great right now. I'm moving on to something else, or I'm just pulling it off my poll list. The better way to go about navigating the waters of, like, what's the next comic you should read, it should be less about the IP. Yes, if you have a a liking to a character, follow your character. I'm not saying, you know, don't read what you, you know, already love, but you have to give a added layer of attention to the variable that is the artist and writers, because when they come together and do something, they're typically taking on things that is available. And sometimes that availability makes something spontaneous. It makes something great, i.e. Superman, i.e. what could be the Hulk. I mean, yeah, like when you mentioned the artist-writer combination, I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, you had the beginning of an amazing story with Immortal Hulk, but the captivating artwork of Alex Ross, who just crushed all these covers. I almost bought a cover, all right? I was this freaking close in the beginning to getting one, but I didn't quite read the story yet, so I was like, uh, I should probably read it. And, um, I mean, I look back and kick myself for it. 
I remember being at San Diego with you in Chris Ruff's artist booth, shout out, and that's where they display all of Alex Ross and Bill S's art. And you were looking at that stuff for quite a long time. I was, I was, man. He was hemming and hawing. Are you canceling Hulk? And I want to see some, like, participation in the comment section. Are there writers and artists that you follow regardless of what they're creating and taking in new IPs that you may not have otherwise added to your poll list? Give some recommendations in the comment section below, and I got a surprise. I didn't tell either of these guys about this. We have something that was mailed in from CBCS. They contacted me and said, hey, I want to send you something. We have a brand new product, and we want to get your reactions. I actually have it right behind me, and you'll notice it's completely covered in white to protect what's on the inside. I have yet seen this. It's not lying. We do not, I do not know what this is. I have no idea what the hell he's about to show us. This is the brand new magazine holder, courtesy of CBCS. And oh, what a cool book to send me in it. I'm holding Swamp Thing Green Hell number three, John Constantine, Dead Man, Animal Man appearance, and ooh, spoiler alert. The death of Constantine. In this alt-reality, dystopian future, we have an amazing run that you need to read, by the way. But we have a brand new case. And now, I'm going to actually hand this over to Jeff because I want to get your first reactions. Because CBCS is known for having very sturdy cases, a lack of Newton rings, which since like we've started doing a lot of stuff on Whatnot, I've had a lot of members actually reach out, and Ryan, you can attest to this, asking questions about these glares on some slabs they've gotten elsewhere because they've never experienced Newton rings before. Yeah, I'm definitely in those DMs on the WhatNot account, and that has come up. But yeah, it is a thing that happens with slabs. Newton rings is a whole subject I feel like we got to cover at some point, but... We really need to discern the difference because people are putting Newton rings as a blanket statement, and it's not all the same thing. A Newton ring was one thing, and then if you're talking about the inner well maybe coming close to your comic and creating, like, this oil look, that that's something different. So, like, everyone needs to just kind of chill, take a second, figure out your lingo, and not just blank a statement and everything. Newton ring, Newton ring. It's, it's not the same thing, and we'll get into that some other time. But first off, let's first talk about the garbage magazine holder options we used to have. CGC is old. Magazine holder was trash. It was really Freaking bad. Trash. Not even recyclable. Not even good enough to recycle trash. It was just garbage. And it would break, I would say, 30% of the time. Give me a solid. In right transit. behind you, there is a Reggie Collects guide to smart comic collecting. Oh. And it it hit a, one corner. It hit one corner, barely. Whole Ooh. thing shattered. It's garbage. Whole thing shattered. Um, and also the label, because the slab was so big, it's like wobbly. So it's at like a slant as well. Um, it's a nice like CGC graded book, though it looks like a regular CGC book, but we're not comparing these today because CGC actually has a brand new magazine holder as well. So we're going to get one of those in and do an accurate comparison. But what are your like initial reactions to seeing this brand new case? I love it. I love it. It still needs to have the quality of plastic that CGC has, but the holder itself... Oh, I freaking love it. It's like, uh, it's very sturdy, very rigid. I tried to just bend it just now. It gave no flex. Um, I freaking love it. And I have a bunch of magazines I'm holding off on to really submit. It's a really small detail, but the thing that jumps out to me most is the, uh, like the label is like flush. Yes. There's no, it's not like indented or, or raised at all. It feels, it feels really cool. It's cut to the exact measurements to fill up the entire slab versus the old CGC labels being approximately 10% smaller than they should be, which causes that back and forth paper movement. Yeah, and the more snug, the better. I mean, th they're already so cumbersome and large to store as it is, so it's really nice to have it hug as well as it does. Well, these ones, um, especially the old CGC magazine holders, there's a lot of extra plastic. It's not as strong, so you're right. It does actually want to pop very easily. Like, I'm barely putting any pressure on it. Are you, um, this one, not so much. Are you sure you dropped it? Are you sure Reggie didn't flex on that cover and, like, it pop? Yeah, it, it, Plastic does that around Reggie sometimes. Shout out to Reggie Collects. Go follow him on YouTube. Um, I, I'm digging this. You know, even... I, I will go as far to say this. The label itself has always been my biggest complaint about CBCS, as well as, like, pretty much every member of the community for over five years and how they haven't changed that is beyond me. But... What I will say is the quality of the case being this nice has definitely improved the look of the label, which I don't know if that was a possibility if I were to have been asked prior to seeing this. Like, I would assume it would be the same. But doesn't that actually look really good? 
It, it looks great. And the one thing, just to give CBCS a, a fair, um, you know, take on it, the labels and the holders are always better in person. Yeah, um, So true. I know we give the labels sometimes crap, but when it's in person, it actually always feels and looks better um, than as we generally, you know, give it credit for. I got to know in the comment section below, are you getting magazine slabs done? Because it costs a little bit more. So I got to know what you're sending down and why. Because a lot of people, like myself, like to grade the magazines because I don't have a magazine long box or short box when I need them. And I end up putting them in long boxes that they don't belong. And then they get messed up upon movement. Or are you grading it because it's spec worthy? And if so, I got to know what you're specking on because these cost a bit more to get done. Yeah, and then the biggest hurdle, really, um, even when you get them graded, is you still have to put them sideways because there's no boxes unless you guys know of a third-party company that makes it that's going to hold a, a CGC or CBCS graded magazine comic. If you guys know, please comment down below. Let us know. But it's long overdue. I would grade far more magazines if they weren't so cumbersome to store. I want to throw this out there, too. I had an idea for a video, and I want to know if you want us to film it. I purchased, and it's on the way, a short box that is being labeled as fireproof. I'm thinking what we need to do is maybe put some damaged comics in there that otherwise would have to be destroyed, you know, per publisher agreement, and see if it'll hold up to the flames. What do you think? You should put some really valuable comics in there to see, just oh, to just make to it piss exciting. Everyone off. Just put a Hulk 181 in there raw and be like, "Is it fireproof?" Dude, Jeff has a plethora of them, and I don't think he needs them. All. He's got a whole bunch. Yeah, let's crack a slab or two, and three maybe, and four, and we'll throw them in the fireproof box. And listen, you, this was a great idea. You had fire, you had comics, and I'll tell you exactly where it went south when you said you're going to throw in one of my Hulk 181s. <laughs> so it's not going to happen. But yes, we should play with fire. We should play with comics, and we should figure out if this is as fire retardant as you claim. All right, let us know in the comment section below and hit the like button while you're down there. We need your damn support. The podcast is back. Oh, and I'm feeling it. So over this last couple of weeks, we had a major industry shakeup as it pertains to big media. We're talking about movies. We're talking about television shows, streaming shows. There is an entire writer's strike that's happening. And the last time this happened, I still remember when it did because it was like between, I want to say, office season four and five. May have been three and four. Like one of the two. And we didn't get Office for over a year. And this is like my favorite show of all time. Imagine how I felt when it was coming out. I was waiting every single week. Changed my life. And we had not just a delay of four months in production. The timer starts once they get back and then they get back to work. So a four-month delay can equal upwards of a year delay of things actually being seen. And that's a television show, let alone a movie, that may take even longer. Yeah, there's another writer strike happening right now. And yeah, like Tom said, last time this happened was 2007. I want to say, yeah, I think you're right. Season four-ish of The Office, which in my opinion is when the show started to go downhill. That's about when I Ooh. stopped loving The Office, unfortunately. It's also season four of Lost, which is when that, I think that's that show's weakest season as well. It's also the shortest. Anyway, that was one of the actually solutions they had to the um, to the problems created by the writer strike was just shorter TV seasons overall. I mean, it's, it takes less time. So what's going on right now? Because the main thing that we're hearing about is the incorporation of streaming services being the dominant way that profit is made from these industries. And how could that relate to the comic market? Classic situation, right? We're talking about a socioeconomic issue where you have the bosses up top, you have the people down below, and people not feeling like they're getting enough money in. But we also have to kind of look at some of this bigger picture of what's happening in um, film period and t television. So with comics, yeah, we're going to get delays. All right, we will get delays. And not only that, we got to worry now, if you have a delay with a show and you have an artist tied to or like when I say artist, I mean an actor, um, what other jobs are they going to have to delay or jump from if they're even able to? So you might even have a larger delay than you think, right? Because like if I'm supposed to time this show right and end so I can jump on my next film, if that's delayed then what happens? Do we lose an actor that could have been the best for that role or, or not? Yeah, that's definitely, a, and kind of, I would, I would almost say an unseen element of the of this writer's strike. Yeah, it'll, it'll shake up all, all sorts of different crew members on all sorts of different projects, and we'll get different things, different results as a result of that. But yeah, uh, since this is a writer's strike, this affects strictly the, uh, the screenwriters of various projects. So since also since the industry knew this was coming for quite a while, there were uh, certain projects that were rushed and 
submitted before this deadline happened. So we have things like uh, House of the Dragon Season 2. It makes sense why James Gunn finished his Superman Legacy script just the other week. I was just going to say that. Yeah, he he, he, he finished that surprisingly quickly. So uh, those are safe. They should be safe to be able to start filming and, and casting and doing all of the things that don't require writers anymore. However, other projects that are a little earlier in the process, because writing does happen pretty much at the beginning, uh, those are in jeopardy right now. And there are several different movies and TV shows that are currently on hiatus until they can figure out this strike, unfortunately. As it pertains to production that may be being delayed that correlate to comic collectibles, there's only a handful on this list, but some you're going to recognize. And I want you to think about the key comics that have spiked in the last couple of years that have had ebbs and flows because of delays already, and then compound that with an additional what could be four to five months delay plus production time. We have Stranger Things Season 5, which we've had multiple occurrences of trending and hot Stranger Things, not just books, but variants as well, store variants, etc. Blade, how's that roller coaster been? That's probably the most comic relevant thing we're talking about here, obviously, since that's based off the Marvel comics. But yeah, we've... Even before the strike, there have been so many uh, hurdles and roadblocks and speed bumps in the Blade production from switching directors and delays while they had to find a new director to, uh, I think, even Mahershala Ali kind of stepped back from the project for a bit until it was a little more solid. Mm -hmm. We actually just got news like a week or two ago that they signed a, an actress, Mia Goth, right, to play an unknown character in the movie. And the Blade is actually, Blade-related spec, that is, has actually made the hot 10 in the trending list recently. It had been looking good for Blade up until last week when the writer strike happened, and that is now one of the projects that is confirmed to be paused. Wasn't it just a week prior to that that they got a writer as well? Yeah, they brought on the True Detective creator Nick Pizzolatto to do like a, a rough a rewrite of the uh, of the original script too, which is super exciting for me. I hope he's I hope he sticks around, you know, for when the strike's over. I love that guy. Another big deal that everyone loves, Abbott Elementary. That's getting delayed. Cobra Kai. That's another book that was surprisingly trending. Multiple issues, variants as well. MTV Movie Awards. It might not be our jam, but if this was in a different time of the year and, like, this was a different award season, if, like, the Emmys were on pause or the Oscars or a bigger tier, like, awards show, I think I think that's, a, that's an ill omen, unfortunately. Ooh, and speaking of omen, Neil Gaiman's TV series Good Omens, you know, and he's a comic book writer as well. Yeah, he's a classic comic writer, obviously, for Sandman and stuff. He's a member of the Writers Guild, and he was a big creative on Good Omens, so he's, he's obviously uh, very impacted here from both sides, comics and TV. There's a surprising amount of creatives in comics that dabble in like the more mainstream productions, you know, writers that kind of do both comic writing and script writing, et cetera, getting attached to shows. We've talked chat about that a lot over the last couple of weeks alone. I would assume that those individuals who are not going to be spending much time doing that may look at comic writing as a possible way to have their not just source of income, but their creative outlet. Oh, that would be interesting. You're saying that they could move from their WGA, you know, whatever title or association and into another industry such as comics? Yeah, one that doesn't have it that also has its own concerns in regards to artists and writers' pay. I'm glad they're striking to get what they are owed. I'm sure there's a discrepancy. Um, ultimately, though, um, you know, I still want to see better writing. Like, how many of these shows have we seen, these movies, at least, not even TV shows, but mostly movies that we're all waiting on? Blade and what other ever Marvel movie it's going to be that we end up complaining about the freaking story. That's why I'm, I'm so upset, man, because we finally got good news about Nick Pizzolatto, who wrote, who created True Detective, which is, I will, I will stand by that being like one of the greatest shows of the 2010s. That's one of the best things I've ever seen in my life. And having a writer of that caliber brought onto a specifically a, a current era Marvel movie, I think really elevates, you know, it's, it's something you can't ignore, Blade. And now, uh, now it's all in jeopardy with that. And I think the uh, the ripple effects are going to be even worse moving forward. Because yeah, this is all short term, and like stuff like Jimmy Kimmel and SNL and stuff that's like on a rapid production schedule, that's already stopped. Like those are already paused, and we're going to get releases of stuff that's already almost done and things they're editing and finishing. Like it's not going to affect anything coming out this summer or even through probably the rest of this year. But once we start getting into early 2024 and the summer of 2024, things are going to get a lot more a lot more sticky. Yeah, and even then, if you get these writers and you get the script you like, you always get worried that some executive producer is going to come in and just, you know, when it comes time, just completely dilute it or ruin it anyway. So, I mean, I don't know, man. I'm just hoping for better projects in the future. I don't know. I'm just kind of going off on a tangent here. But, gosh darn it, guys, just so you guys aren't too scared, 1988 was the longest strike, and that was only from March to August. So we're not talking generally years here. 
okay? So I'm sure they'll come to some type of terms eventually. Um, so it will be a delay, and there will be effects, and um, it's unfortunate, of course, the comic market, but even then, let's talk about the comic market for real. How hot does it really get anymore? When we hear a little bit of a buzz, it's a flash in the pan, maybe a week before that book either stays or slides. Okay, so is it even fair for us to put so much weight on a movie anymore to drive the comic market? All right, I mean, I think the comics can maybe drive themselves at this point. We've kind of seen it plateau. Either the book's good or the comic market's there for the collectors. And yeah, you might get a flash there where it spikes for a short minute, but then it really comes back to reality pretty quickly because, I don't know, maybe we're not seeing the huge success in the movies that we're hoping, or that's it. We've like, this is a lot going on. Dude. There's funny so is, many movies. Kevin Feige recently came out and said, like, you know what? We're going to slow down the the amount of production we're doing. There's too much stuff coming out now, so we're going to put a, a little bit of a break on you know on all this stuff coming out so fast. And now they're like everything's shut down. So I don't think he meant it in that in that sort of way. But I think one of the reasons we don't see as much of a of a boom, you know, an impact in the in the comic market and the aftermarket is because there's just so many projects, and every week we get news about some other thing to make us. Everyone's always switching their focus, and it's hard to stay locked in on one specific book that we see week over week, like something like Omega Man or Last of Us. We were chatting about the binge model and how that has been just horrendous for the collectibles because the hype is just lost. And this writer's strike and the concerns that have been put out, it's been very revealing on the creative process. All along the way, as things have changed, more money has been garnered from streaming services, and that hasn't had the 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 trickle down effect that you would expect it to to the creative teams putting these on but additional to that the way that they produce scripts and stories has also changed where they hire these like writers groups for particular projects and sometimes it's just paying for a bunch up front so that they can then use them later over time at their leisure and because of that you're seeing a lot of quick work happen and it's like commissioning scripts and if those payments aren't like really beneficial to the writers and they're not like trickling down as we're describing as that they want, well, you get what we're left with, which is people who traditionally years ago would get the commercial money and have like solid paychecks from their writing work to now getting dollars. Like literally some of the quotes are like under $10 for streaming air episodes. Yeah, yeah. for commissions like on the- uh, when Like the, the royalties. The royalties on it. Yeah, I'm it makes sense. They got a paycheck every time there's a rerun of Seinfeld or whatever happens. You get you get a little a little cut of that. You know, every time there's a commercial that runs on your show, you get a little cut of that. Now in the streaming era, there's not really reruns. It's just on the platform forever, and there's no commercials on those usually. So, what is the uh, where does where does that money go? So I think the whole point of the strike now is that the creators really just need to have an an updated contract for the streaming era of TV that we're in right now. I want to know in the comment section below, is now the time to start seriously specking on Blade? You heard why we're excited about the movie, but also why we're super disappointed. Will that translate into drops that will make some collectibles a bit more exciting to purchase? Help your fellow members in the comment section below. Jeff, we get asked all the time about this giant collection find. We've teased it out a little bit. There's a lot of reasons why we haven't gone full, just cameras on and showing every part of the process. Because when we get together to start working on it, it's so much work that the little bit of filming that we do takes away from so much of the work that this like mound of comics doesn't seem to be shrinking. You guys brought me over one time to help you catalog and like look up prices and stuff. And I was there for a few, like for one day for a few hours. And I'm just like, I'm out. I can't do this anymore. This is way too much work. I'm never going to finish this. So That's right. good luck. For the next three months, we're going to put our head down and we're going to get through this entire collection at least once. One pass through at least. So let's do that. Uh, yeah, like you said, it's a huge undertaking. And don't get me wrong. We love it. It's what we do. I love it. But it does take time. And so when you throw in the content... You know, you go from some from going through a box in like a minute and like three minutes or so to now trying to film the content of it, which is like 20 minutes later. OK, so if you multiply that times, I don't know how many thousand plus boxes we have there. It's just unbelievable amounts of time. But we're still going to do it. We're going to put out some amazing stuff for you guys. So keep following. Um, but we should talk about I only sold one book recently from the Golden Age time frame. Yeah, there's a lot of Golden Age in this collection. We're going to be bringing it to the table. You brought last podcast, uh, number 71, a bunch of like 
choice Wonder Woman keys and some like JSA like early high grade books. Batman a lot of 4. resto. Batman Four was in that. So check out that podcast. You did a... mention one thing you sold in that show though. I remember you said yeah. specifically I've only sold I've only sold one thing. We teased it. Well what I did is I hit up the guru and I'm like, yo, what's the one collectible that stood out among the rest as far as like it being unique? Because there's a lot of great books in there, a lot of exciting books and there's a lot of money as well. But if we put money aside out of all 350,000 books, which would be the one that you would say is the most special, unique oddity? And when you told me which one it was, I was surprised to find out that it was already sold. You know, I like oddities. I have a stack here of oddities. I have a comic here that was printed without a cover. I have a cover, a comic here that's missing the correct color strike. And I have a double cover too, which I like double cover. So stay tuned to the end of the show because we're going to go through these before we're done. Yeah, so this book was a Sensation Comics number two, okay? This is the third appearance of Wonder Woman, and it was a double cover. So the outside cover was fairly nice, okay? I wasn't sure 100% what it was, but I saw that it had an interior cover as well, and that's just shocking, first of all. But it looked unbelievably gorgeous, and I was like, whoa, this is a really nice book. And so I realized that I'm not going to keep it. For myself, I don't need a double cover of this high value of this type of book because it means nothing to me. There's many other books that I would love a double cover in, and this is not one of them. So I was like, okay, let's get some money back in from this collection. Did you find it after we took it back home? I don't remember seeing that upon arrival. I cannot recall if I saw a double cover before. We tried to go through all the books, but we only went through the Batmans and checked them for grades. So I don't think I saw that until I got home. And so here's a photo of it so you guys can see it as well. Now, I took this in person to a CGC booth at New York Comic Con to get it graded and looked at by Matt Nelson, who's the head grader there. He's a head of CGC and, now. Yeah, head of CGC, right? And um, I had him take a look, and he looked at it, and he was like, Jeff, this is a gorgeous freaking book. This could be a 9.6, potentially. Dang. Nine six. That's unheard of. Right. The highest graded of this book, there's two 9.0s. All right. So I sent it off and I was like, you know, you never know. All right. What it's really going to come back. They see it in person. You know, they're just kind of checking it out and it's impressive. So I'm waiting. And of course, it's a pretty quick turnaround time with a book at this tier level. Yeah. How long did it take? I gave it to them in person. So by the time they got it back to their location, I think it took like three days. Wow. Like ridiculous four days. It ended up coming back nine four white pages. Okay. So an unbelievable grade already. And to have an uh, outstanding page quality of white. The exterior cover was a 7 0. So it's still presented very well. But the grade on the label is a 9 4. Isn't that crazy how much where the cover takes compared to just one page in? That outer 7 0 cover made it so that that second cover remained a 9 4. For its lifespan. Question. So if it is a double cover, they grade it based on the inside? Yes, of the highest covers. So if you have like five or six covers and it's not. Because sometimes that happens. Sometimes it's like, happens. yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's 10 covers, nine covers, eight covers. I mean, it happens. It's rare. Doubles are already rare. So just imagine the multiply. Right. So it would be the highest graded cover of, of all those. And generally, uh, so. I would have assumed they do whatever's on the outside. Yeah. <clears throat> because you can always rip off the outside. Then you have just a single cover nine four, so they'll go by whatever. That was my case. next question. Okay, yeah. and uh, to be honest, there was a whole chat that started off of like, oh, I think the seller because once this book, so all right, before I jump to that because that's also an interesting topic because people talk online. I get this book in the mail. It's a beautiful book. Okay, I'm like all right, this needs to go somewhere. I don't want to keep it. It's money, and I want to get it out, and I have no idea what it's going to sell for. It's the highest grade. You just never know. You know, you get a few people in there who want to go battle at it. So Those people were talking crap or talking about it on the internet before yeah. or after the sale? So I submitted to Heritage, and Heritage put up the listing for one of their auctions. So they sent me a catalog. It was on the interior front cover of the catalog. All right. Featured book, baby. Yeah, That's pretty and cool. I, and I negotiated the, the whole um, commission that they're going to take because they'll take uh, – so they'll take 20% after the sale. So if a book goes for $1,000, then it goes – it closes at actually $1,200. Okay. They'll take that 200 Okay, but you can at certain high level books you can negotiate. I want hundred and five percent, so you get an extra five percent off of the the BP, the buyer's premium. Twelve hundred or eighteen hundred for what? For the book. 
so you if, said if it sold for if, if it, it sold, sold for two thousand, oh a thousand, oh, okay. and it was twenty percent BP, which is the buyer's premium. That oh, they, they add for. to that. The actual sale is two twelve hundred, and okay, they get sense. that two hundred dollars. So the it's an buyer, addition. The buyer pays that extra money. Uh, the buyer pays that extra. It doesn't money. come out of your cut, so it's not eight hundred dollars. No, so you get the thousand, they get the two hundred. Gotcha. Okay. Good clarification. Now, for a certain level of books, after a certain point, or your relationship with them is good enough, you can get. You can ask for a higher percentage. So you say 105%, 108%, just depending. Okay, So it's something you can play with depending on the caliber of the book. So I did that with this book because obviously it's a high-value book and it's a special piece. Okay, It's going to be one of the higher-selling books through that auction. But it popped up. All right, people, When a book pops up for the next auction, all right, people know. They follow that. All right, Big collectors will wait for that day so they can start bookmarking which books they want to follow. So in CGC chat, somebody started a thread of like, oh, check out this sensation. And then it became conversation of, ooh, was it a smart decision to leave that outer book, that outer cover on, or just have it be a lone single cover, 9-4? Okay, and then that started to get me double guessing. And it's like, there, the, a lot of the conversation was, oh, that person's gonna just want a beautiful presenting book. You know, that outer cover is really gonna oh, hurt it. interesting. Right, but then I'm like, uh, what are the chances? Like, what am I going to do? Pull it down now, send it back to CDCs to have them remove the cover, and what if the grade now changes? Okay, I was like, I'm, I don't want to take that chance. I'm going to assume that somebody's going to want a double cover because it adds that extra maybe interest to somebody else. The double cover market, the highest graded market, the white page market, third appearance of Wonder Woman. I mean, I think it had so much to it that I just I didn't listen to it. All right, so. And I was okay with that decision. That's such an interesting variable to add because we're talking about a collectible that's so scarce that it's gone past a point to where now it's kind of going the opposite way, where you're losing out on people who would actually buy it for more money because it's too scarce. Yeah, and I was like, listen, if somebody really wants that, they can remove the cover themselves. Right. Okay? I'm, I was like, I don't need to do this. I'm not going to overthink it. And that's what people— what would be like the percentage on that thread that you saw people say, you know what, that should be a 9-4 presenting book, not a double cover? Now, that's a good question. And I'm going to go through memory because it wasn't the longest of thread. I think it was just a couple pages and then I just stopped following it. Still a considerable amount for a Golden Age comic. Yeah, I, I would say maybe 50-50. Wow. Let me know in the comment section below. 9-4 Sensation 2, double cover? Where the front cover is a 7 0, it doesn't look as good, but the second cover is that 9 4, or lose the double cover, tear it out, and have a 9 4 presenting the highest grade in existence, Sensation 3. Let me know. And the 7 0 cover was nice. The colors are great. It was a beautiful cover still. No resto. No resto. It presented very well. Lucky there was no resto. There's a handful of resto in this oh, collection. Absolutely. I, we had a, yes, yes. There's, a, there's quite a few books. It could be a whole video. Yeah, yes, it can. Um, and so, with that book, it finally went to auction, okay? And um, I'm watching it, and— How long is the auction? You, you could start bidding, I think, up to a month before, okay? So you can start doing that. And then then the auction goes live. So it stops the bidding. It's You put in all your pre-bids, and then the day the auction goes live, you now have to bid live, all right? Unless you put a reserve that's much higher already than the live bid. Sure. So then it goes live, and someone's either on the phone or on the computer, and you can watch it. There's When you go to heritage.com, heritageauctions.com, you can see a live auctioneer there on video, and your book comes up, and, and you see the numbers increasing. And um, I got to see the book come to the end, and I have no idea where it's going to go. Okay, I was like, this can go anywhere from say 20,000 to who knows 100,000. Do you remember some of the steps that it took? Like how, what were the strides like? Did it did it have like hundreds of dollars in bids and you're like, "Oh geez, this may not have been a good idea." Or did it start out strong and plateau or was it just creeping up all week? Yeah, so um the auction um I believe when it went to live was somewhere around 20,000 or so. What was your gut in like if it hits this amount, I'm happy? 40 so 40 is the start. It hits 20 out the gate. How not, you feel? Not out, yeah, not even out the gate. It took time. Oh, okay. okay. So it, it creeped takes, up a little bit. It takes bit. all this stuff time. You'll see, like, you'll you'll watch these books for a month, all right, and you'll see these numbers, but it isn't until it goes live that you realize how many other people are waiting to bid on an item, especially artwork. You'll see artwork go threefold from where it is. 
So for the comics, I was like, okay, I'm ex- I'm hoping for more, but it's, it is kind of an odd thing. It isn't an ultra key like you know some that most people would expect, but it's got a lot of things for it. And the higher the, there are people who want the highest graded, plain just simple as, it, as that can be. Okay, so I just need a couple people bidding the, at each other to try to get this. And it's and it's the highest by far because it's a nine four and it's a nine zero two nine zeros, and so um. It starts going, and I'm watching it, and it feels like it, it's going to get to 30-ish, and then it almost likes about stops there. And then all of a sudden, it takes off again. At what point in the auction is this? This is This mid? is the countdown. Okay, this so we're like, in countdown the, mode. The, yeah. You're watching it approach 30, and this it starts live. going up the slow. Book, now it's my turn. Lock, whatever number comes up. Sensation Comics number two, white pages, nine four, yada, yada, yada. Giving the whole description of this book, and, they're, and the clock's just ticking, and people are bidding. I'm like, okay, where's it going to go? Where's it going to go? And so it keeps climbing and climbing. I'm like, okay, come on, get to 40, get to 40, at least get to 40. So it gets to 38,000, okay? And I'm counting and waiting for another bid, nothing. So it closes at 38,000, but with the BP, it actually closes at 45,600 because it's 20%. So it's another $7,600 on top of that. So I negotiated that. So I'm going to get, I think it was 108%. So I'll get, you know, the 38 plus 8% of the BP. Not bad. That's like right around target. That's right around target. Right. And so I think it, whatever that math is, 43-ish thousand or something. Four. Wow. Yeah. So it was exciting. Um, but again, you, know, you just never know because you look at the promise uh, pedigree. I mean, those books went nuts. You know, you just never know what's going to happen at highest yeah. graded, you know, levels. By the way, one of our biggest podcasts we ever released was covering that uh, pedigree collection and that collection came out and sold at the most ideal time in comic history so um, let us know what you think in the comment section below you think the guru did well it's like how do you even like assess a book sale like that it's such a crazy thing to talk about such an expensive book but also when you consider how rare and scarce like to to think of where that was for such a long time and that it didn't just get one fold, you know, just that one thing that could have prevented that from being a 9-4, outstanding. Um, so we have a couple oddities here. I want you to pick just one of them because when we come back in two weeks, we're going to talk about the next two. Just pick your pick one of the three. I'm not going to look. I'll pick this one because this is one of my favorites because I just, I don't know. I kind of like it. All right. Pass it over to Fire Guy. Make sure the water is not oh, around. Geez, you guys are I doing like, this to me again? I like pushing Ryan to try uh, new things. So what's this worth? Uh, Talk man. a little bit about it. Oh, I have no idea. You don't uh, even know what it's worth? Okay, so this is just an oddity. This is an oddity. I just kept it. I didn't care what Oh, dude, it's Doctor Strange, baby. This is a 169. You know what I thought of? This makes me think of the Hulk cover. Yes. Sure. Is that intentional? I'm sure yeah. it's... It's kind of like that because you have um, on the front... You have Doctor Strange, but then his astral projection. Let me just hold it up so you guys can see on camera. How do you say it? Astral? Uh, yeah, astral astral projection, and then it's gray, too, just like the Gray Hulk. Yeah, so instead of Hulk 1 with the Gray Hulk behind him kind of like, you know, showing his evolution, we have Doctor Strange and more Doc Strange. Why, why is this odd? Well, I mean, and, like, if you just had a guess really quick, what yeah, do you see. think is off? Like, just gutturally, what do you think? These purple colors look off. Yeah, the colors look wrong. Yeah, it's missing a color strike because it's all pink and he's got blue. And I think it's missing. Oh, his, his yeah, his clothes. His clothes are wrong. Yeah, so it didn't get hit with, I think, probably blue. Weird. So now. On the, the inside, too, or is this just want... the. I, I believe it's just the cover. I didn't check the inside, to be honest. So part of the printing process, they add the colors in, and sometimes. One of the colors just won't make it, like a magenta or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It you ran out of right here. Somebody didn't change the color. It's supposed to have blue. There you go. So the first thing that I would check with something like this is, one, could it have faded because of sun damage? That is sometimes something I see on eBay. People will go, oh, it's a color error. But really, it's just a book that's been in a freaking you know, display on a storefront for years and the sun just ate it up. But you can tell that that's not what this is because... The yellows look really good. Yeah, the yellows look good and that's supposed to be blue. Yeah, you know the one color is missed over the others. I wonder if the back cover... I think the back cover is probably just generic. Yeah, just a generic back cover. What a weird one. Yeah, I wonder what the back cover would look like. But now, uh, Doctor Strange 169, that is a key comic book. First uh, solo Doctor Strange, yeah? 
Glad I did not know that before. Now you can do this with me at home. Utilize Code Tom 101 on the best comic app in existence. It's available for both Androids and iPhones. Key Collector Comics. That code will unlock you a free two-week subscription. Did I say the code? Tom 101? I don't remember. We got to get to searching a character search of Dr. Strange because I want to make sure my key knowledge is on point. So I go to the character search. I type in Dr. Strange. There's a bunch of comic books because Dr. Strange didn't debut in his own title. Can you give him a bit of a rundown how that happens sometimes? Marvel was putting out uh, characters in certain t- uh, titles such as Strange Tales, Tales to Astonish. It's kind of a test market. Tales of see, Suspense. Tales of Suspense, exactly, um, to see how – uh, whether they flourish or not. And so Strange Tales 110 was actually the first appearance of Doctor Strange, and he wasn't even on the cover. So he won't get his uh, name and his own title until this issue right here, uh, issue 169, where it becomes Doctor Strange. And when you go to Key Collector, you scroll down, you'll see this transition here, um, and you can have it omit the non-key issues so that you just get the ones that are like more collectible. And Doctor Strange 169 came out in June 1968. High average sales of 1.4 thousand, formerly titled Strange Tales, first solo Doctor Strange issue, origin of Doctor Strange retold, first appearance of Charles Benton, later becomes Osmodius. Look at that blue. The blue is indeed different. Hit the like, slap the subscribe button. We're going to be back here at the table to talk about a bunch more expensive paper. But before you leave, hit the link in the description. Go to ComicTom101.com. All you need to do is sign up to our newsletter. That way we can communicate to our members who signed up who won the giveaway of a show that we do. We have, at the end of this month, a monster giveaway Rhino's first appearance in Amazing Spider-Man 41 at a 5.0. You get the book. I need to keep the frame because this goes on the set that we clearly are redoing. Yo, guys, I tried to redo the set over this last week. I spent hours on it. I changed the color to a different color. Right. And I'm not even going to tell you what color it was because by the end of it, I looked at it and realized I ruined the freaking set. You sent me a picture. I'll just have our editors put it in the... (laughs) We can all see. It was embarrassing. I sat in this chair, looked at the camera, and realized I completely ruined this room. And then had to spend another, like, few hours redoing the room. We're in a transitional period, comic fan, but it's all Crashdown's fault, which means that it's a shared blame. My fault is what he's trying to say. It's all Ryan's fault. Blame Ryan. It's this guy's fault. So go pre-order Crashdown. It's in Previews Guide right now. We could really use your support. And if you are a retailer and you're interested in doing a retail variant, hit us up on Instagram. Fire Guy Ryan will get you in touch with the people you need to talk to because we have the lowest print run minimums of any whatnot publishing book that's come out thus far. And as always, geek responsibly. Enough said. I'm so stoked about this. Today's the day of the upload and I happen to be announcing a surprise 1 in 150 variant drop. We have the prolific, the JLA artist, Kevin McGuire, doing an homage to the first appearance of JLA, Brave in the Bold 28, a crashdown variant. It looks outstanding and it's a high ratio incentive. No one's seen this yet. Like if you're watching this right now, you're seeing this for the first time. So take a look at previews, order a bunch of books. If you're a retailer, I hope you order enough books to get this one. And also, have a great day, a great weekend, have a great life. That sounded a little grim. Just have a great weekend, and then I'll see you on Monday.